Okay, I don't have my magazine here, but this is Hastings 1066. This was a Richard Berg game covering the Battle of Senlac Hill, the big battle between William and Harold. Uh, as opposed to the battle between Harold and Harold. What particularly, well, first off, this is one that I picked up, I don't know when. Uh, certainly not right when it came out, but not too much later. Uh, it, it intrigued me as in, there weren't a lot of medieval games available at that point. There still really aren't proportionally, but uh, with things like the Men of Iron series, oh, there's a little bit more coverage than there was then. Here you had some, a couple old SPI games and otherwise that's about it. Well, and those weren't available to me, but this was. Yeah, you can see though this is a TSR era s and uh, game. You can tell by the board yeah, a little glaring in the colors, but not horrible. But the glossy damn counters that are side mounted and slip all over the place, but whatever. Anyway, uh, I had started uh, reading the rules. I had finished reading the rules and was all ready to set it up. And I got the opportunity to borrow Poseidon. So that bumped this aside. So I don't know how well um, I know this anymore. <laughs> But I don't remember it being a terribly complicated game. What's really exciting about this particular game is these little order uh, selections. Um, what it has is basically a system not entirely like, but somewhat similar to that used in the Musket and Pike games where you select an order and you might have trouble getting out of it. Well, it's got different specifics about it, uh, very different ones. Um, it's the first time I've, I saw a board game with this kind of order where you select something and you roll a die to see what you actually do kind of uh, thing. You try to make a choice and it may or may not work. Well, uh, however, I have the feeling that there were certain mini systems and modern armor comes to mind where you use this kind of pre-plotted chits for formations to determine what they're going to do. Okay, let's take a look at what uh, the game's about. Let's look at what the components, especially the on-map uh, pieces are. First of all, you have your terrain here, which is not looking at a key. Uh, but I believe this goes down into the swampy area. This may actually be lower, I'm not sure, but it's not really that important. And then we start climbing a hill. Oh, here we go. Yeah, this is actually the lowest level. Um, and we have Sunlock Hill up here at the top. Uh, you have selections as to stances. And then you're going to roll a couple of dice and see what actual battle order you're going to be doing and um i believe the different players have different i know the different players have different strategies that can happen um out of it now that is going to have effects on your morale level ideally i think you want to keep your morale kind of at normal once it starts drifting down this way a's and b's um you're seeing morale deteriorating and then morale gone but C's and D's, you're looking at exhaustion effects. So basically you combine aggressive action with more resting action, uh, like more defensive actions. Um, oh, that sounds like my phone. I don't know. I should, I went and ignored it. Um, bunch of different uh, tables for combat here. Melee combat is going to be a differential. Missile fire is actually going to be, uh, this is kind of the opposite of your uh, terrible swift sword based games, is actually going to be an odds ratio. <laughs> well, maybe not the opposite. That's usually just a numerical, but um, some modifiers to uh, the different tables there. We are going to worry about missile supply in particular. If a leader's in a space and the units take a casualty, 
the leader might take a casualty, and since that's basically how Harold lost, was taking an arrow to his eye, that's going to be pretty important. You have your train effects chart. I guess the interesting thing here is this is the battle order display where you mark down each particular type of unit as to what it's doing. So like here we have Breton Knights and whatever specific order that they're given all uh, I'll be attached by that. Now, how do you determine the stance? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> I know I've got these little pieces of paper. This is to uh, th these I used um, uh, in order to record um, some some losses that you have to record for the game. So I'll see what that has to do with it. And the game is going to be played in two assault periods, uh, which go for eight turns but can be extended. Um, basically, after the first assault period, the two armies kind of reform, and uh, the Saxons get another uh, a set of reinforcements coming in. The Normans do not. That's in this cup. I think they get the rest of these on when they go between the assault periods, but I think there may be reinforcements before that. What there are, though, is a random pick at the beginning of the game where everything except the house carls and these bowmen um, are just selected at random. So you don't know exactly how good a group you have, although I think this, the select third, is automatically present, those orangish colored guys. Okay, well, if you have orders, you have to have different commands, and that is actually the case. For the Normans, they have commands divided into foot and horse for three different national contingents. For the Saxons, they're going to divide their frontage up into flanks, a center and a left and right flank, um, that are going to be commanded by the individual three leaders there. we have that's of any interest. During a turn, each player selects a strategy for the turn and rolls dice to see what the orders are. And I think that's done in its secret. Uh, ah. Hmm. Yeah. So you can like put death on the Bre Bretons. And that'll affect both the Breton Knights and the Breton Foot, although they may have different, because there are difference between Foot and Knight, they have different orders uh, that take place for that. Over here, uh, the orders, if I can find the chart, wherever the hell it is. <laughs> this is designed as a two-player game, of course. <laughs> so we have to walk around the board. Um, yeah, the orders here are are not divided as much so like you don't you don't have shield wall charge as your you know, I don't know what it's shield wall hold over here I guess the Normans have different right no shield wall aggressive I don't know what that's supposed to mean <coughs> okay so where do we go uh, Basic sequence of play, you get an attempt to rally disrupted and routed units. Great. Uh, then you get to fire your missile units if they're in range using the missile fire table. Uh, then you get to move units. Okay, now there's a reaction phase in this, which is certain units under certain orders are able to do a reaction move. Um, and then the defending player gets to fire. So this is kind of like uh, kind of like the Terrible Swift Sword uh, system in terms of the firing uh, ordering, which is to say you have sort of a pre-movement fire phase for the attacking player and then a post-movement defensive fire phase. The difference, of course, is the pre-movement fire phase in TSS is only for art artillery here. The archers have uh, that. And then you have a melee segment where you uh, attack all the units, and this is actually forced, uh, that are in your zone of control. Or that you're in the zone of control of. Oh. 
if half the Norman combat units are on the hill, at the end of the eighth battle turn, there'll be two more turns added. If more than 75% are on the hill at the end of the eighth battle turn, it goes to three turns and no more. And that's the only time that you make the check is on the eighth turn. If all undisrupted, unrouted Saxon units are entirely surrounded, the game will not end until that uh, surrounding is broken. Well, the assault period will not end, which could be the game. The Norman is allowed to ignore shield wall and hold orders if he desires. And he can roll separately for foot or knight sections of nationalities. And the Saxons can reroll attack and pursue if desired. This is only during that extended period of, a, of an assault. Okay. So the Saxon army is kind of complicated in terms of how you determine it. It's going to be based on the command radius. Hey, we didn't talk about the units. So yeah, let's look at what the values are. The commanders have a command range and then a rally rating, which is going to be a bonus that they give to things they're rallying. And we don't know exactly how that works, but we'll see. Whereas regular combat units have an attack value, a defense value, but then also values if they're in shield wall formation, which improve their defensive value. Some markers here for disordered, wounded, and let's see, routed, and shaken. Don't know what all of them do. Okay, so the Saxons divided into three wings. Um, they're determined at the beginning of the, ba of the battle turn. No Saxon leader can have more than 20% of his units available. And a given leader can, uh, yeah. If the Saxons are ever dropped down to less than three leaders, then the numbers shift a little bit. The Normans are in six segments. They're divided by their leaders. Leaders never affect the order of their units. An army can operate without leaders. Uh, you must clearly define wings and sections. That's really only an issue for uh, the Saxons. And then you pick set, uh, strategies for each wing or nationality each battle turn. And these will influence the orders that you're going to get. We've got four different things marked here defensive, moderate, aggressive, cautious. I think mod is moderate. Uh, where is that? Do, 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 do. Uh, then you roll a couple of dice to see what the actual order is going to be. And that is the order they're going to have to follow. And that has an effect immediately when you roll it on the overall uh, morale of that force. The Saxon player rolls for each wing, the Norman player rolls for each nationality. The knight and the foot will be read separately, but it'll be one die roll. Uh, the leaders don't have any orders. Some orders will last for multiple turns. We have to mark that, like if you're in charge two, you'll move down to charge one for the next turn, just to indicate how many turns of charge you have to deal with. The order is optional. You're allowed to kind of choose the order that you want. And then we have the different options. And shield wall is going to give you a defensive bonus. You switch to the shield wall values. You're not required to attack. You have no movement, however. But you are allowed to fall back one hex to the rear during a reaction movement, if I recall correctly. Uh, there may be more. That may be even during normal movement. Uh, bows can never be in shield wall. The bowmen will be in this melee fire in place order instead if shield wall is adopted by that command. Melee fire in place. You use normal fire uh, combat strength. You can fire melee normally. You have no movement allowance, but you can either advance or retreat a hex as long as you do not enter an enemy's out of control. Advance to combat. Uh, you move normally. And you may move towards the enemy. Attack and pursue. 
or not. You can move away from the enemy too. Uh, it's advance away from combat. Attack and pursue is for Saxon foot only. If they're in this order, they must move towards the nearest enemy unit. If they're not adjacent to an enemy, they must move close as possible. If they're in an enemy zone of control, they can move as long as they uh, end up adjacent to an enemy unit. They cannot move during friendly reaction phase. During melee, their combat strengths are normal. Uh, however, if they use if they uh, give a D result, it upgrades to an R. And if they route an enemy unit, they must pursue. Attack and pursue may, remains in effect, possibly for multiple turns. Uh, it's not there. It's going to be advanced to combat. Hold is the same as shield wall, except knights use their normal combat strength. They don't have a special strength. Advance is going to be the same as advanced to combat. Uh, totally flexible. Charge. Okay. Charge is going to allow the knight and units to increase their combat strength. Um, it must end in contact with an enemy unit. It cannot cross a ridge or stream hex side or enter a marsh or woods. And the last two hexes cannot be uphill. Well, that's going to be tricky, but not entirely because the Saxons are sitting on the uphill, uh, on the top of the ridge. And there's, it's not really a layer cake, but it's determined, you know, that you're not going to get penalized for charging over most of that hill. It's only when you actually go up uh, that final crest where, where you get hurt. Of course, you would get hurt if you had to go up here, which is probably pretty smooth, just as smooth as this. So you can gripe however much you like about it. I'll, I probably will too. Um, okay, when charging, you have a movement allowance of six, and all knights in the section must move towards the enemy, uh, whether they actually fulfill a charge. Units in the order cannot move in friendly reaction. In melee, they add one to their combat strength, two if they're charging downhill. Uh, D results are treated as R's that they cause. After a successful charge, the knight unit has to make a morale check. And it may route, I guess. This may be a disorder-only route. I know there are some of those. Routed enemy units may be pursued by undisrupted knights. Uh, charge order, again, multiple turns possible. William's Guard. Yeah, over here, it's a nice quality knight unit. Uh, it's free to move around it wherever it likes, as long as William's alive. Uh, if William dies, it becomes part of the Norman Knights. The red guy's over there. When entering the game, Saxon units are in advance to combat until they come within a command radius or move adjacent to an enemy unit, at which point they join the nearest wing. Harold's Huskarls. Um, these are going to be less impetuous than the third. This is optional. Uh, they treat attack and pursue as an optional order. The Saxon player must make this decision prior to when he rolls the die and cannot change his mind after the roll is made. I don't know why you have to decide at that point. I don't see much advantage given the way the game works. All right, we're going to pause because my throat is kind of going. And I don't like doing rolls anymore. It's pretty much uh, <coughs> your normal uh, movement for the game. For these kind of games, you look up uh, terrain effects. They have movement point costs, which generally isn't much. But let's see, going uphill, no additional cost. No additional cost. Okay, but marshes have an additional expense as do the woods and streams. The actual movement points are listed here. This is very burned to put things uh, there. And yeah, because this is just attack defense across. It's just whether you're shield wall or not. <clears throat> uh. Okay. So... Movement within two hexes of the hill or the top of Senlac Hill does not count as uphill. 
units must actually move into those hexes or the upslope hexes in order to be moving uphill. Yeah, so you're not talking about the direction in general. You're talking about the actual... Um, hmm. Yeah, if you're within two units of two hexes of a higher elevation moving in the direction of the higher elevation. Okay, so that means this like from here to here is considered uphill. So actually quite a few hexes will be considered uphill uh, on the slope. The exception to that is some Senlac Hill, right? <clears throat> 275 foot, that's this. There's another specific space where it doesn't count. Uh, laterally doesn't count as moving uphill. Downhill is going to be the reverse of uphill. Each time a no, uh, Norman knight tries to cross a ridge, a ridge. Uh, a ridge is the dark stain. Um, in either direction, you have to make a morale check. If they fail, its movement ends. It doesn't say where, but I assume they don't make it through the terrain. If the knight becomes disrupted, its movement ends. It remains in the hex until rallied or moved in a later segment. If undisrupted, it continues to move normally. If it enters a marsh, it goes through the same check. I assume it doesn't actually succeed, but here it actually says if it, if it enters. This says tries to. So I think you actually make it into the marsh, but you don't make it up the crest. We'll see how much I remember of that. Um, okay, reaction move. So during your reaction move phase, which is during the opposing player's turn, basically, um, foot units, let's see, only eligible units can use reaction. The following are not. Saxon foot in a zone of control of a knight, any unit in shield wall attack and pursue or charge, and any unit that's not in command range of a leader. If it does reaction, it has to make a morale check after the movement. It cannot use missile fire in the following defensive missile phase, unless it's a bowman. Yeah. Other guys have javelins and stuff. Uh, which kind of doesn't make sense because if you're reacting forward, <laughs> throwing a javelin would make sense. But whatever. Only one combat unit per hex uh, in an ending movement, but you can pass through each other. Knights cannot move into an occupied hex if they would have to make a morale check and might get stuck in the hex. Uh, zones of control. It's going to be your frontal hexes and your face hex vertices. You must stop when you enter an enemy zone, a controlled hex. You can move no further. You can leave an enemy zone of control as long as you don't move directly into another one. Bowmen can never voluntarily enter an enemy zone of control. If they start that way, they must move out of it if they can. There's no penalty if they cannot. If both friendly and enemy units exert a zone in the same hex, both units control the hex. Facing, like I said, you're facing a point. Uh, missile units can only fire through front. Melee is only through front. If you're attacking in flank or rear, you get a potential bonus. And melee in the rear is a plus two. Defensive ratings don't change... Uh, so like shield wall don't stop being shield wall because they're being attacked from the flank. They're still given that defensive advantage. Mm, missile fire. Do we need another break? Uh, during friendly missile fire, I really hate doing rolls nowadays. Um, the firing player determines which of his units are going to fire. You look at the missile matrix and what you're going to be doing is comparing something to something else because you get a ratio. And... Uh, total fire strength. There we go. So you compare the weapon type to the range to get a fire strength. You can combine them up, and that'll go against their normal defensive factor. Uh, you probably roll on the missile table, and it looks like that generally causes morale checks, disruptions, and actual points of damage.
Okay. Leaders can take casualties from missiles. No shit. Let's repeat some rules again and again and again. These are actually a little wordier than they need to be, and there's what, you know, 10, 12 pages of rules for all of that. Even, even TSR held up pretty well to the old SPI rule books. They just did a really horrible job on the, uh, on the graphics. Uh, units cannot fire through other friendly combat units unless they're using high trajectory fire, which is for bows only. And I believe it's a column shift against you. Okay. Um, the opposing sides basically couldn't replenish missiles from what's being thrown at them. Norman Bowman and Saxon Javelin spear units can only fire a specific number of fire segments in each assault period. And this will be listed on the missile supply table over here. I said Norman Bowman and not normal Bowman. <laughs> um, note, though, the Saxon Bowman is able to pick up lots of Norman arrows and shoot them back. I don't know if there are any javelins on their side. I don't think so. They can throw back. Oh, if one friendly unit fires in a segment, you have to you consider that entire wing or section to have fired. Optional roles, players can keep track of units individually. Good luck with that. Um, you know, we could use counters from something else, but you know, it's not worth it. If missile units in a given wing or section fire fewer than the allotted times for the assault period, they can transfer them to the next assault period. Saxon Bowman and Slingers have no problems. Uh, the Slingers can just pick up rocks, I guess. Melee combat. <clears throat> Unit can melee units that are in its zone of control. You can't melee through flank or rear. You must melee units that are in your zone that are exerting a zone on you uh, with preference. Any combat unit that's not disrupted or routed can attack. Uh, each unit can only participate in one melee per segment. No enemy can be meleeed more than once per segment. However, you can have more than one friendly unit attack an enemy unit, as long as everything that needs to be is attacked. Uh, and other such permutations. You can't split these things. When more than one unit attack a single defending unit, uh, they are all affected by any M or D result, but only one of the attacking units takes a step loss on a one result. Uh, the melee table is going to be a differential between the attacker value, the number on the left, and the defensive value, uh, which may be modified. And you get an attacker defender losses off that differential, a la the TSS system. Uh, okay. Terrain might have some effects on uh, the combat. Uh, like attacking across a ridge has a modifier. Um, if the leader is stacked in a hex that's either attacking or defending, it adds one to the strength of the unit. If it's Harold or William, it adds two to the strength. Results, which are similar. Disruption is explained here. Disrupted units cannot move uh, unless they're in an enemy zone of control with an order that allows movement. They can move one hex out of the enemy zone of control in a friendly reaction segment only, and then they have to check morale. Disrupted units don't have a zone of control and cannot attack by fire or melee. They defend normally. Further disruptions have no effect. Disrupted units that take a reduced result are both reduced and disrupted. I think reduced is flipped over. Is what they look like? Yeah, they look the same. I don't know the answer. The answer my friends. Yeah, kind of doesn't tell. Interesting. I thought a one was just a death. Huh. It's 
flipped over to reduce side if it's already reduced it's yeah it has no effect on capabilities uh, okay. all retreats are conducted by the owning player um, they take a path of least resistance they can retreat through but not stop in friendly occupied hexes if they if you're routed through you have to make a morale check if you cannot complete your retreat you can displace the blocking units by moving in the hex in any direction. <sighs> Friendly units can be displaced in a chain reaction. However, if it can't be completed, uh, the final the whole displacement doesn't take place, and the original retreating unit is disrupted and reduced in the last unblocked hex it could enter. Victorious units can't move into a hex vacated by an enemy unit unless eligible to conduct pursuit. Pursuit occurs when the unit, whether attacking or defending, is in charge or attack and pursue order, and routes an enemy unit. How do you route? I guess off morale checks, like that they can be potentially worse than disordered. The problem is morale check sends us to different places, like one place it sent us to 5.45, one place it sends us to 9.6. Hopefully we'll actually see how it works in 9.6. Uh, okay. Immediately after the routed unit is retreated, the victorious charging or attacking and pursuing unit must move after it. They will stop only when they either move adjacent to the routed unit or into an enemy zone of control. Uh, this doesn't spend any movement points. They stop once they enter an enemy zone of control, a new one that they haven't been in before. They can ignore enemy zones of, zones of control of enemy units they start in. I don't know what that means in all cases. Like the way it's worded, it, there is some ambiguity there. Uh, routed and disrupted units must be rallied to function normally. Rally takes place in the rally segment. Uh, to rally a disrupted unit, you roll. Uh, you note the morale and roll on the rally table. Sure, are a lot of tables here. So here's the rally chart. Morale table gives you a range at which the unit returns. Oh, you can rally only once per segment. Routed units are automatically rallied if they're within the rally range of a friendly leader. Doesn't say anything about disrupted units. To conduct a morale check, you note the unit's morale, roll a die, and consult the morale table, which can give you disorders or routes, depending on how bad the morale is. Which means good units never route. <laughs> like the house carls, they will not route. They will at worst disrupt. Because two disruptions don't equate a route, if I recall correctly. Said somewhere. Uh, further disruptions have no further effect. Um... Okay. Cav is subject to disorganization by a variety of reasons. Some of them might be movement rather than morale. Uh, that's no big deal. Routes. Uh, if you get a route off one of those morale checks, though, it's only counted as a disruption. Units using reaction movement. Check morale after completing the movement. There it doesn't give that exception, so I think they can route. Units adjacent to friendly units routed by melee, uh, by opponents in charge and attack and pursue, must also check morale. Disruption results are ignored, but route results apply. So basically, if one unit routes, other units near them can route. But something has precedence over this, 9.62. doesn't really seem to apply. Mm, there's no limit to the number of times a unit can be forced to check morale. All right. I'm going to pause. I have to load this all up anyway. Leaders. <sighs> so there's a number of leader counters. They have a command radius and a rally range. Aha. 
You can rally any any unit in the range as per the rally rules. Now, I thought that was just those were automatic, right? Yeah. Okay. So the leaders automatically rally routed units that are in the range. Non-routed units have to make rolls, and routed units outside the range make rolls. Uh, Norman subordinates can only affect their own nationality. William can affect anything. Harold is the central wing for the Saxons, at least at first. Leaders have a movement allowance of six. Unfortunately, like the TSS, we don't see movement allowance anywhere, I don't think. That's always kind of upset me when they don't write it down. Uh, I mean, yes, it's in the rule book, but it's not, uh, it's not present on a table or anything. Here it is. So knights are four or six, leaders are six, everything else is three. Um, You would think by now, because this is after the great battles of the American Civil War, second incarnation, where they started printing them on the map, that they would put the uh, movement point costs on the map somewhere, just so players can see them more easily. Oh, the leaders... Oh, okay. You can force a unit to retreat by running up to it with an enemy unit. Not really a goal, just something that the leader will run away. If a combat unit stack with a leader, it adds one to its melee strength, two if it's William or Harold. They don't affect missiles. If a disrupted unit is within the rally range of a friendly leader, the owning player subtracts one from the rally roll of that unit. Well, that's new. I don't know if it's written in here. I can't read upside down, and I got the rules on top of my other chart. Yeah, I got a little too little table here, but I had a lot too much table if I used both of them. And it kind of made me unhappy. Uh, when a leader takes a one loss in melee or missile, they might become a casualty. Roll in the leader casualty check somewhere or another here. I don't see it. Damned if I know. There it is. I, I find the layout, I mean, this is obviously not Simmonson era. I find the layout, just the colors and everything, makes it really hard to find anything in a way that, like, the later games are easier. But anyway, you get uh, a possible result there. And if it's killed or captured, they're removed from play permanently. If they're wounded, yeah, it would suck to like have either of the kings be captured. I mean, that would create an interesting storyline. A wounded leader uh, remains in the game. He'll be flipped over to his ineffective side. He moves at two movement points per game turn, cannot rally or affect combat. Uh, basically, the goal is to get them out of the fight, I guess. Wounded leaders that are wounded again are killed. Shaken leaders that are wounded are wounded but alive. I don't know what shaken does. If either William or Harold is killed, all friendly units within command, his command radius must make a morale check. I don't see any effect for shaken. I'm trying. Okay, so we got rules for it here. He's ineffective for the battle phase. All right, we've already set up according to the initial deployment, and it's done by you know, little markers telling you which units go where. Uh, old SPI's trick, right? Avalon Hill did it too, so don't blame just SPI for the stupid idea. And it, it's kind of useful in some way. There's an option to do a variable deployment where you don't have to put them in the fixed positions. Uh, during the first assault period, the Saxon player will be getting 12 Great Furred. Uh, two in each of the first battle turns, and then one unit in the last four. Reinforcing units uh, arrive probably along the road there. Uh, arriving reinforcements pay the cost of the first hex entered. I think they come in line. They advance to melee until they're within the leader's command radius. The remaining units will happen between the assault uh, phases, and they can be set up on Senlac Hill. So 
after the first assault phase is complete, if the Normans haven't won, then all combat stops, routed and disrupted units are checked, and the armies are removed from the map and reformed. The Normans are reformed first. All routed and disrupted units are automatically rallied as long as at least one friendly leader remains on the map. If there aren't a friendly leader, then they're just eliminated. It doesn't have to be there later. At the end of the first assault period, all units are examined to see if they can trace a path of hexes free of enemy units or zones of control to their reforming area or to any friendly unit that can trace such a path. <coughs> units that cannot trace such a path are eliminated. For this purpose, friendly units negate enemy zones of control. <laughs> what? Did we run out of rules? Not quite. Uh, the Normans reform their line as desired at least four hexes south of Senlac Hill. Their flanks are limited. The Normans can rearrange the location of their sections at the beginning of the second assault period, but they can't intermix nationalities. The Saxons reformed in any manner they wish on Senlac Hill, the highest two elevation levels where they are. Um, the last 12 Saxons will be placed at this time. The Saxons can reduce the wings in their army if they meet the proper limitations, which I think is like they've lost leaders. I don't know. 412, 413. 13. That's what I seem to remember when it said. Yeah. <laughs> That's about all I can see. How do you win? So the Normans have to make their way through to London. Harold's army is in the way. If the Normans had been stopped, Harold would keep his kingdom. Well, I don't know about that, but they certainly would, it would cause issues. Um, because there's a question how long William could stay in the field. It was already fairly late in the year, right? Got a date here. I don't remember when it happened. Uh, okay. Um, if the Normans win a strategic victory, if they control all the road hexes on Senlac Hill. And that's really just this little line right there. If they've lost more casualty points than the Saxons, they win only a tactical victory because their army's probably not strong enough to make it through. The Norman wins a strategic victory if he eliminates all the Saxon Huskarls. However, if he's lost more casualty points than the Saxons, the game is a draw. The armies have just kind of worn each other down. The Saxons get a strategic victory if the Normans fail to accomplish either of their victory conditions by the end of the second assault period. William's been stopped in his track. And casualty points are determined by the value of uh, the quality of the morale of the unit and then also by the leaders. And you can see losing a leader is a big deal here. All right, we're about ready. I'll send this up um, and then I can get started.